<laughs> this meeting is being recorded. Okay, so it's probably going to show up on everybody's. But we, um, we can start the recording when I upload it to YouTube because apparently Zoom and I are having a dis dispute about putting it live on YouTube. So once this is done, Luke, I'll upload it there. Okay. All right. No problem. And uh, close the. And there should be an option for you to mute everyone, um, unless yep. everyone could mute themselves. There should be an option for that, which helps with the sound. I just... <laughs> Folks, have go in here. I'm trying to do all that for everybody. Yeah. I keep getting Kim up for some reason. <laughs> Hello, Margaret. Too. Hmm? I keep looking at it too. The other option is everyone could mute their own microphones um, if that's easier. That can also also work, and then that way, audio should be a bit clearer. All right. Well, um, okay. I will be sharing a presentation during the talk rod but first if maybe you could I, you could give a bit of an introduction and to then the i'll make you the host Society, and then you can yeah hand over to me thanks so good afternoon from east fort washington we're on the mad i'm on the very fair question we're an international society of amateur and professional scholars that have an interest and focus on the fields of chivalry, heraldry, history, genealogy, and nobility, including royals past and present. We were founded in 1957 by Sir Rodney Hartwell, and we have continued our founders' efforts forward since then. Well, we have a group of attendees today, over a dozen folks. There's 29 people registered, so we may see other folks come in during the course of our conversation including the speaker and myself. So to me, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. When I scan the registrations and I, I'm now looking at my notes for this versus the screen, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that our founder, Standard Bearer, his incredible daughter, Dame Jessica Hartwell, signed up for this and I hope she is able to join. Um, it's good to, it'd be good to see her. And we have also the Dean of the Society of the Descendants of Scotland, uh, Lee Dorwin here, and he is in South America when joining us from there. So. Uh, Dean Dorwin, thank you for being here, and I owe you an apology. I've got something that I was supposed to have responded to a few months ago, and apparently I completely missed it, so I'll get that to you. And um, also one of the other people here that was registered is, uh, to, is JQ, a friend and scholar, a remarkable person, Jonathan Query, and he has a presentation on YouTube where this presentation will be posted here shortly after, and JQ and others that are there, and including one previous one by the descendants of the um, of the, con of the conquest, is, is available there. Those are free, always available. We also have a presence on Facebook, which you might have learned about this presentation. And now is a couple of week, weeks ago, one on Instagram. So look for the Augustine Society on those platforms. Again, this presentation is being recorded. It will be posted to YouTube. And we'd ask that everybody mute their individual mics here uh, so we can have the presentation start. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce very briefly the Dean of the Society of Descendants of the Conquest for today's presentation. Luke Ironside is an enthusiastic dean for this lineage-based organization that's a subsidiary to the Augustan Society. Uh, you can join the Augustan Society, or you can be a member of the Society for uh, Descendants of the Conquest, and, and that there's ways we can help you with bo doing both of those. Like its members, Dean Ironside can, can trace his lineage back to those that accompanied William the Conqueror in the England in 1076. No, 1060. Oops. Sorry, Rod, we're losing you a bit. Interesting. Okay, you're the host. 
Oh, all right. Okay. Sorry, we lost you for a second there, Rod. Uh, I think, I think right, we I'll... did at least, but uh, it's all good now. Okay. So you've made me host. If so, I can share my presentation. So thank you for that uh, introduction. And I'll be talking a little bit more about what the Society of Descendants of the Conquest and the Augustan Society do during my presentation as well. So I'll just share my screen. So you should hopefully now be seeing the, the presentation. Is everyone seeing it? Okay, fantastic. So the title of today's talk is The Legacy of the Conquest. And obviously here we're referring to the Norman Conquest of 1066. We're really going to be focusing on what happened after the conquest in the immediate aftermath and more in, in the centuries that followed, even going up to the modern day. Um, but that said, we are going to look at the background of the conquest. So if the Norman Conquest is reasonably new to you or you don't have a lot of knowledge um, about what happened in 1066, uh, we will briefly cover that as well today with a focus on the aftermath. Uh, to briefly introduce myself, well, Rod already did a bit of that, but yes, I'm the Dean of the Society of Descendants of the Conquest. We are a lineage society attached to the Augustan Society. Um, and the Augustan Society has a number of other lineage societies, such as the descendants of Scotland, um, Ireland, and others. Uh, essentially, it is a society for people who can trace their lineage back to either William the Conqueror or one of his recognized um, companions in 1066. But aside from genealogical activities and research, we also do a lot of historical research about the general Norman period, uh, the medieval period, and that's really what we're focusing on today. So we, we did have an event last year where we focused on genealogy. It was called Tracing Your Royal Ancestry uh, to the Conqueror and Beyond. That was really a genealogical event. Today we'll be a bit less focused on the genealogical aspects and more focused on the historical uh, research. And I will throw a link to the, um, the descendants of the, the Society of Descendants of the Conquest in the chat box. Um, you can obviously also from there get to the main Augustan Society website. And there's a bit of information about how to sign up on there. Um, if you are interested in learning how to trace your ancestry, you can check out the YouTube channel and have a look at our past events, Tracing Your Royal Ancestry, which gives some useful uh, genealogical advice and just some general tips about how to make a connection in your own family line back to a noble ancestor and from there to a royal ancestor. All right, well, with that, we'll go into the background of the Norman Conquest. So here in the map, we've got the general state of England at this time in 1066. Uh, you can see the different ruling earls and the sort of subdivisions which were common in England. Obviously, at this time, England was not a... Um, it, there was no United Kingdom of, of Britain, so we have the separate territories of Scotland and Wales, the separate kingdoms, and then we have these um, reasonably large subdivisions within England, each under the control of a particular earl. Um, so the Norman Conquest was the invasion and occupation of England in 1066 by an army composed of thousands of Norman, Breton, Flemish, and French troops, all led by the Duke of Normandy, uh, known at the time by his enemies as William the Bastard, but later known as William the Conqueror or William the First. Now, what caused the war is what we're going to look at in the next few pages. But William the First Reign would go down as one of the most influential mon monarchies in the history of England, sparking significant political, economic, social, and cultural changes as a result. We're going to trace each of these changes in today's talk. 
For a bit of context, here is the connection or the relationship between the English royal family at the time of the conquest and the Dukes of Normandy. There was already some association between the two, as we can see in between the, the marriage of um, Ethelred and Emma of Normandy. So there had already been some association between Normandy and England and the House of Wessex by that time. So essentially until until the early 11th century, England was uh, under the control of the House of Wessex. Most people here are probably familiar with Alfred the Great um, and his descendants. And so the House of Wessex was essentially that line. However, things changed with the Viking invasions of the early 11th century with King Canute becoming King of England and things got a bit more complicated and the House of Wessex started to lose a lot of their power and influence, which will really lead to this gap, uh, which allows William to come in. We see on the other hand, we've got the Norman Dukes, which are quite a, a well-established noble family in France at this time. Um, we've got a succession of Richards and Roberts, um, eventually resulting in the birth of Duke William, who was as the name or as his um, epithet William the Bastard suggests, he was illegitimate, but still managed to, to gain a, a significant following on his father's quite early death. Um, and then we have Earl Godwin coming in the picture, uh, who will also be a significant figure due to his son, Harold, later becoming King of England. So a bit of a complicated situation. We've got a sort of um, Game of Thrones type scenario going on here with various claimants to the throne. Uh, so a bit, bit complicated, but this gives a general idea that there, it wasn't just a sudden out of the blue invasion. There was already a relationship between the houses and the crown of England was reasonably unstable at the time of the conquest. So it wasn't just an out of the blue invasion. There was sort of some precedent there and some connections um, which spurred William to, to conquer England. The map also shows a little bit of, of what was going on at the time of the invasion and highlights some of the key areas. So we've got Normandy and then we've obviously got the key uh, battle sites of Pevent and landing sites of Pevensey, Hastings and Dover, where much of the action took place. So to give the historical background to the kingdom in 1066, there were two claimants to the throne at this time being Earl Harold Godwinson of Wessex and William, obviously, of, of Normandy. So if we go back here, you'll notice Harold down near the bottom here, if I can. Okay, so being the son of Earl Godwin, who was Earl of, of Wessex. And so he wasn't himself as such a an established house, but rather a new claimant uh, to the throne. Uh, his father, Earl Godwin, had originally been loyal to King Ethelred and later to King Canute. If anyone is currently following the, the TV series of Vikings Valhalla, they've probably been following this, this storyline and might know what I'm talking about. And so that leads to these two claimants, the death on the death of Edward the Confessor, both of these laid claim to the throne, uh, Edward the Confessor being the, the last king of the, the House of Wessex. So Harold had himself, had himself immediately crowned king of England just one day following Edward's death. Uh, we have a quote from a contemporary historian who stated that this unfeeling Englishman did not wait for the public choice but breaking his oath and with the support of a few discontented friends, he seized the throne of the best of kings on the very day of his funeral and when all the people were bewailing their loss. So obviously it's maybe not the most unbiased perspective. There were, there were two perspectives. There were those who were very loyal to, to the claim of um, Harold Godwinson and those who were very loyal to the claim of uh, William of Normandy. Apparently, before his death, Edward the Confessor had promised the throne to William. So again, there was some precedence for him believing it, it was his right uh, to take the throne. 
So essentially, we have these two sides. We have King Harold Godwinson, um, whose successes included defeating Wales in a series of campaigns from 62 to 63. And we have William I, who began fighting battles at the early age of 19 and finally secured Normandy in 1047. Uh, here we have some maps which show the essential uh, event of the Battle of Hastings and the invasion, but we're going to go into that in a bit more detail. But for the sake of those who are watching the video later, if you'd like to pause or go back to the maps and have a look at, at how it all played out, they are here. Now, the most uh, famous event, of course, was the Battle of Hastings. Uh, but prior to that, we had on the morning of 14 October 1066, two great forces gathering to fight. Uh, seven miles from Hastings, assembled on a hilltop were the forces of King Harold, who had been crowned just nine months earlier. So it was reasonably soon, less than a year after his coronation. The evening before, the English and Norman armies had encamped within each other's sights at the place now known simply and appropriately as Battle. Duke William had sufficient time to prepare his army since landing in Pevensey more than two weeks earlier, and as an invader in an unfriendly land, William's intention was to force a decisive battle with Harold and to claim the throne as quickly as possible. So it was, it was supposed to be a quick invasion, and William had been waiting for quite some time for the weather for the, the weather to be appropriate for him to cross over to England. And he had sort of set it all up. So this was going to be a quick takeover. He didn't want a lengthy battle and he didn't have the resources or the money for a very lengthy battle or war. So it was supposed to be a quick or immediate takeover. Then coming to the most famous event, we have the Battle of Hastings. Harold's depleted Saxon troops had been forced to march southwards following the bitter bloody battle to capture Stamford Bridge in Yorkshire a few days earlier and were therefore at a significant disadvantage. William attacked with both cavalry and infantry, while Harold's army fought in the traditional sort of Anglo-Saxon style entirely on foot behind a shield wall. It took most of the day for William's forces to break through this shield wall, but once it was eventually breached, William's cavalry had an opening and attacked the vulnerable English. Before long, King Harold died during the battle due to being struck with a chance arrow. Uh, the battle continued until all of Harold's housecarls or guard soldiers were slain and William finally emerged victorious. So as William hoped, it was quite a quick conquest. Now, this itself could be a talk, and if we had more time, we could go into all the specifics of the strategy and the different uh, events leading to this battle. But as we're focusing on the legacy, that's just to provide a very brief background to the event and what happens in 1066. Now to go to the main part of the presentation, the legacy of the conquest. While the Norman conquest impacted England and the surrounding area, in a complex range of ways. Some of the changes that res resulted included political changes to the structure of the government, uh, obviously to the monarchy, societal changes in the relationships between different groups of people and to uh, daily habits and, and cultural, cultural differences between the Normans and Anglo-Saxons. There were some quite serious religious changes in the replacement of uh, Anglo-Saxon bishops, um, which were mostly replaced with um, Norman bishops in the, instead. There were a lot of uh, culinary changes as well. Some new food items were introduced as a result of the Norman diet being significantly different from the Anglo-Saxon diet. And very importantly to today, and of interest to me as an English teacher, there were also some linguistic changes which took place. And we're going to go into that last one in particular towards the end of the presentation. So each of these has its own category. But firstly, considering the whole period of change, there's a quote here from Richard Madswick, who is an osteoarchaeologist at Cardiff University. He stated that for the elite, the nobility, everything did change radically. The administration of the country, the legal frameworks, the organization of the landscape. 
but at a lower level, people adapted to the new normal rapidly. So as we're going to see going on, this was mostly a change in the at the higher levels of the government and among the nobility, because there was a great redistribution of land, uh, especially under the, the feudal system used by William the Conqueror. The, this land was being redistributed to his companions or the soldiers who, who fought um, during the conquest. Um, one of my own ancestors, aside from William the Conqueror, was a, a soldier who fought with William the Conqueror by the name of Strode, and he acquired lands, he acquired, he acquired the, the manor of Strode for his services to William in this battle. So we see it mostly changed at the top, but of course there were some level of changes at the bottom as well. But generally for people at the lower levels, it was it was life as normal and the, the shift was not too drastic, um, except in a few instances, as we'll see, such as the harrowing of the North. So to look at how the, some of the cultural differences or the societal differences between the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons, well, the Normans' cultural roots define them as both Vikings and Frenchmen. So some here might know that William the Conqueror himself was descended from a Viking by the name of Rollo. Uh, Rollo and other Vikings had settled in Normandy and had essentially become French, had taken on French culture and French habits and had adapted to the French language and way of life. So by this time, they were essentially French, but with this, this Viking background, uh, which maybe set them apart from other other Frenchmen. Following the conquest, the Normans drastically impacted and changed English society, bringing their language and passion for the arts and culture into the formerly Anglo-Saxon country. So now look at some of the political and societal changes that occurred following the conquest. The victory at Hastings was not followed by an immediate transfer of power. So although the, the battle itself was swift, the battle, the battle was quickly, uh, quickly over and William secured his throne, there was a lengthy process whereby William consolidated his power, sort of switched those in, in positions of government for those of his own men. Um, and there was this, this drastic change um, across the country. The fighting did continue in segregated parts of the country. So there, were, there was resistance among individual Anglo-Saxon nobles and conflict between them and the Norman conquerors for, to, for the next five or so years until around 1071. William was kept busy with repelling two invasions from Ireland by Harold's son, so remembering Harold who crowned himself King of England, and putting down three rebellions in York. So despite him wanting a quick takeover and getting that quick takeover, there were other aspects of the situation which were reasonably unstable. And then gradually Norman laws were implemented this did stir up some discontent among people in society, among the general citizenship, as they had to adapt to new customs and laws, which were quite different from those they would have been perhaps following for some centuries under the rule of the House of Wessex. As I mentioned, land and power were vastly transferred from the Anglo-Saxon to the Norman nobility. So that's perhaps one of the greatest changes which occurred. With that, a lot of the place names also changed. So there was a renaming, uh, borders were changed. There was a lot of change going on in that regard. Then... One of these very important events following the conquest was the harrowing of the North. This occurred from 1069 to 1070, when the last Anglo-Saxon claimant to the throne, Edgar Etheling, made his stand in the North of England, rallying the Anglo-Saxon and Danish lords around him and pro provoking a violent Norman response. So this was really the last major major sort of resistance to William's rule at this time, this, this 
fight um, by the last Anglo-Saxon claimant to the throne. After paying off the Danes, the Normans defeated the Anglo-Saxon nobles by a series of massacres and burning crops in a campaign known as the Harrowing of the North, who obviously did not do a lot to make him more popular among the, the citizenship or the public. The aim of the Norman conquerors was not, in fact, the extinction of Anglo-Saxon culture, but rather the halting of rebellion and dissent. So William did show quite a lot of leeway in terms of allowing the, the people, the public, to continue their local traditions. He didn't really have any wish to convert the general population to a Norman way of life. What he did want to do was implement a Norman structure to the government and ensure that people were accepting his rule and accepting him as the legitimate king of England. He didn't have any wish to convert the culture or the, the, the population to a Norman way of life. And so we get this great divide, really, between the, no the Norman nobility and the Anglo-Saxon population. And William was fine with that. That's it, that wasn't the problem. The problem was the, the continued Anglo-Saxon resistance by members of the House of Wessex and certain nobles. So the harrowing of the North would go on to have a significant impact on language and place names of the affected regions because we get, again, this shifting of ownership. So as these places are uh, destroyed or conquered, we find that they are then given to William's friends or William's allies. And so this redistribution usually resulted in a change of place names. And maybe, a, a, or at times, also a change of, of borders. And so to understand this um, impact in a bit more detail, we've got to understand the Norman bureaucratic system. So one thing that William did was to make significant changes to the Anglo-Saxon form of government, streamlining a new system to replace the formerly relatively decentralized and uncontrollable system that had been the norm under the House of Wessex. So as we saw, if we go back a little while to the start of the presentation, as we see here, it is really quite decentralized. We have all these different regions, each of them under an earl, and this earl really having a lot of autonomy. So there's, there's a great deal of autonomy, and these these are very powerful individuals, uh, which would uh, which would later allow Harold of of Wessex to essentially take take command of England as king. Uh, so this was really different under William's rule. There wasn't this strict sort of separation of regions, there was rather a really centralized government implemented. But some aspects of the former system were retained, particularly this sheriff system that, for allow, that allowed for greater control over the shires into which England was split. So this was something William found useful and which he kept in his own government. But obviously, the Anglo-Saxon sheriffs, sheriffs were replaced by Normans, which was basically the rule for anyone in any kind of position of authority at any kind of high level. One other important development of this period was the Domesday Book, which was a census ordered by William for providing easier governance in the years following the conquest. And I'm going to look at this book in a bit more detail. So this census was carried out between 1086 and 1087. It was kingdom wide, really. So it was it was from all throughout the kingdom. The results were compiled in the Domesday Book, which represented the most comprehensive survey of any medieval kingdom throughout history. So it really was very comprehensive and is common uh, a common primary source for understanding the demographics of this of this era, provides invaluable statistical and demographic information on this period or in the immediate aftermath of the Norman Conquest. So considering that this happened just 20 years later, it's, it's really an important resource for understanding this time. And the evidence compiled in the Domesday Book demonstrates that feudalism was further developed under the policies of William I. 
So having a look at the feudal system in a bit more detail, it was much like the feudal system of other regions of Europe. Essentially, under the feudal system, the manorial system was developed further, and this had its origins in Anglo-Saxon times. So that's something that William kind of adapted from the Anglo-Saxon system and just made changes as he felt was appropriate. The system divided the kingdom into the smallest possible unit of land, the manor, which was enough to support a single family. Each lord could have hundreds of manorial units under his rule. Then related to these changes in the redistribution of land were the architectural changes taking place at this time. The Normans are one of the things they're most well known for would be the castles and the churches that they built all across England and the, the cathedrals in just the first few decades of William's rule. So he was really a, a really great builder. He constructed some of the most famous landmarks in England, uh, including the, the Tower of London as pictured above. And these were not considered merely as defensive structures, but as bases of operation through which entire regions could be controlled. So they were really strategically planted across the kingdom in areas that William either wanted to develop or which were already very key centers of society or heavily populated areas. <laughs> they often served as bases for cavalry, which could be deployed quickly wherever needed. There's also that military element to it. Uh, which provided for greater control or greater defense. Modern Bailey ca castles were the main kind of castle, especially at first in the early years following the conquest, but they did quickly fall out of favor, being replaced by stone castles and fortresses <laughs> as technology changed and as these became the norm in general. In addition to building castles, there was also a huge increase in the construction of churches, as can be evidenced by the many Norman additions and entirely new buildings from that time. So we have a few examples above. The Tower of London is perhaps one of the most famous um, architectural, Norman architectural uh, developments. And then there's a church from this is St. Andrews by the Ford in West Sussex, near where I used to live, actually. Uh, this was originally an Anglo-Saxon church, but as the Normans often did, they adapt, they, they changed it. They, they made some additions to the church. They uh, adapted it to their own style. And many Anglo-Saxon churches in England had this kind of, th these ad adaptations taking place. They also constructed from scratch uh, many churches as well. Here are a few more classic examples of Norman architecture. We've got this Norman arch. We'll see it's a really common uh, structure throughout England. So you, you'll see this in many different types of structures, uh, whether it be castles or churches or cathedrals. And usually when you see this very characteristic shape, it's going to be a Norman arch. We also have the keep uh, of Headington, Headingham Castle in Essex. And obviously there's a lot of similarity between that style and the Tower of London. So it's also quite characteristic. Another very interesting change which occurred, but not quite so significant as the architectural change, changes were culinary changes. So the Norman conquest resulted in many changes to the English diet. Before 1066, beef, lamb, mutton, and goat were among the meats most likely to be served in England. They were the ones that the, the general population and especially the nobility would have been eating. But the, the Norman conquest led to more controlled and standardized mass agricultural practices resulting in an increase in especially pork, but also to some extent chicken dishes. And here from the, the Beirut uh, tapestry, there's a depiction of a feast following the conquest. And so one important thing which allowed for this was a steady food supply 
after the conquest. So as Dr. Elizabeth Craig Atkins of the University of Shef Sheffield mentions, an intensification in farming meant that people generally had a more steady food supply and consistent diet. And there's been some interesting archeological uh, research done by analyzing, um, analyzing bones and, and so on of people who lived during the period uh, which revealed these changes. One other change was new spices being introduced, which fundamentally altered the Anglo-Saxon diet. And in one book from the 12th century, the Urbanus Magnus, or the Book of Civilized Man, which was essentially a book of madness or a book of uh, upper class behavior or etiquette, uh, it provides some insights into the English diet in the century following the conquest with specific flavor combinations including serving fish with pepper and matching beef or pork with garlic and wildfowl with a cumin sauce. So we see a, a couple of changes, a couple of new spices entering the English diet at that time. Then very interestingly, there were many linguistic and cultural changes which took place, some of these lasting until today. So there was this great shift in language where essentially the Norman nobility spoke Norman French, while the common people continued to speak Old English. Now the Anglo-Saxon language or Old English was a Germanic language and the Norman language was French essentially being a Romance language. And although the Normans had originated from Denmark and Norway, uh, during their Viking period, they adopted an integrated French culture after they settled in Normandy, as we previously mentioned. And here we can see some comparison between Old English origin words and Old French origin words. So words such as, for example, almighty, as you might find in a religious text, in Old French would be omnipotent or in Old French origin would be omnipotent. So we have this chain where both these words then become common in the English language, much like amaze or astonish, brotherhood or fraternity, blossom or flower, fall or autumn. And so this explains some of these, the, the one reason why there are so many different words in English for saying the same thing, but with very different linguistic roots, right? We have woodland and forest. And so over time, certain ones would take on precedence. For example, in England, it is more common to now use autumn instead of fall or forest instead of woodland or valuable instead of worthy. So over time, it sort of adapts, whereas some words maintains their prominence, such as uh, think over conceive or room over chamber. Really what there was, was different languages for different classes, where French was the most dominant language among the new Norman nobility and the subjects continued to speak English. The most significant linguistic change was the addition of thousands of French words into the English lexicon, with an estimated 40 to 50% of English words in use today having French roots. So obviously this is a, an aspect of the legacy of the conquest, which really continues into day-to-day -day life. And notably an increased number of French root words are used in academia, demonstrating the importance attached to French as opposed to Old English as the language of education and culture among the higher classes. So this also makes sense for two reasons. One, because it was essentially the higher classes who would be receiving an education at this time. And secondly, because it would be the church giving the education at that time. The church would be doing the educating. And because the bishops were mostly replaced with, with Norman bishops, French also becomes a significant language in the church. This is also found in the stereotype as French as a cultured language. And on the, on the right here, there is a brief overview of the history of the, the English language showing this 
change over here in, in 1066, led by William the Conqueror. Normans invade England and establish themselves as the ruling class, after which we have this, or shortly after which we have this transition to Middle English, where a lot of these French words have entered the lexicon. We also notice uh, a bit later on, yes, that th th this integration continues for several centuries after, especially words relating to royalty, the law, and food items. One other important thing to relate the, the culinary changes to the linguistic changes is, of course, the diet of the nobility and the diet of the common people was going to be quite different. And that is also reflected in words. So one very exa uh, important example of the cultural divide, as shown by language, is the words used for animals and the words used for meat products. We find, for example, that in modern English, farm animals generally have Anglo-Saxon roots. So we have words like cow, sheep, pig, whereas the words for the meat produced from such animals generally have French roots, beet, mutton, pork. That makes a lot of sense when you consider that it's going to be the nobility enjoying this, this meat most of the time, with the peasants growing or, or cultivating this these food sources, right? So to sum before we conclude the talk, just to summarize some of these significant changes which took place as a result of the legacy. First of all, the Anglo-Saxon landowning nobility was almost entirely replaced by Normans. This was true in the nobility as well as in the church. The government became much more centralized, with power and wealth being held by a smaller minority, and significant changes were made to the feudal, feudal system, with William rewarding his companions and allies with gifts of land and wealth. Most Anglo-Saxon bishops were replaced with Norman ones, and many dioceses headquarters were relocated to cities rather than the countryside. Norman Martin Bailey castles were introduced, which reshaped warfare in England, reducing the necessity for and risk of large-scale field engagements. Feudalism developed as a common system that would last for centuries, as William I distributed lands in return for military service, as we already mentioned. Manorialism was the natural result of this, developing a system in which laborers worked on their lord's land, and this would continue for several centuries. The north of England was devastated for a significant period following the harrowing of the north between 1069 and 1070. The Domesday Book, a detailed and systematic census of the land and wealth in England, was compiled in between 1086 to 1087, providing valuable insight, primary source insight into life at that time. And France and England also became historically intertwined, initially due to the crossover of land ownership. So Norman nobles would therefore usually own lands in both countries. Coming as they did from Normandy and being lords already in Normandy, they would then gain land in England. And so there's this connection. There'll be certain intermarriage as well, also due, due to ties of language, culture, and family. So then we get lords who have significant holdings both in England and in Normandy. The syntax and vocabulary of the Anglo-Saxon language was significantly influenced by the French language with lasting influence until today. All right, so to conclude this brief look at the legacy of the conquest, we find that William's conquest of England resulted in lasting and dramatic changes for both the conquered Anglo-Saxons and the Norman conquerors themselves. The fate of the two kingdoms of England and France would become inseparably joined in the centuries that followed. In the modern world, the legacy of the conquest lives on in the names of people and of places throughout England, and in the words that form the basis of our daily vocabulary, as we've seen significantly in, in food items. 
the conquest remains a central chapter of English history, profoundly transforming the face of Britain and the lives of its peoples. All right, well, that concludes the talk itself, but we do have time for any questions or comments related to this topic of conquest or the legacy. So if anyone does have a question, please feel free to either raise your hand or simply maybe to turn on your microphone. It's like the day sometimes. He's waiting to see if anybody is going to ask. Luke, you're, you, muted, you muted yourself. I'm sorry. Yes. Well, I was asking if anyone has any questions or maybe my talk was comprehensive enough that there isn't, which is uh, also a good thing. It was well done. That's for sure. So I'll, I'll throw one out just and it's completely from left field in some regards. But you talked sure. about the changing of the bishops from the Anglo-Saxon to the Norman uh, supporters. And right. I'm curious whether you could comment on what that did to some of the former pilgrimage and saint sites that were identified pre-conquest. Right, that's a good question. And I don't have any definite knowledge on that front, but I imagine that it would have resulted in changes to pilgrimage there because the same thing really happened when the Anglo-Saxons themselves invaded England. And there was before that a, a form of sort of Celtic Christianity. And what, what replaced that was dr dramatically different than what what existed beforehand so if it was anything like what happened during the anglo-saxon conquest of england former sites may have fallen out of usage especially with the move the move of the diocese to great cities instead of the countryside it's, it's quite possible that former shrines or former holy sites may have lost some of their their prominence there may have also been an increase in pilgrimage to say certain areas of france as well uh, as a result of the pilgrimage with, uh, with the result of the uh, shift in yeah, the shift in culture to a Norman focused church. So there probably were some some changes in that regard, but I would have to read up on that a bit more. For example, if, if we look back at the uh, Celtic Christianity that existed before the Anglo-Saxon conquest, a lot of that was sort of imbued with a, a paganism of the past. And so there were, for example, sacred wells, sacred springs, sacred wells, holy trees in England, which had been sacred as pagan sites, but which had then been kind of adapted to Christianity and had, instead of being associated with a god or a goddess, were then kind of associated with a saint. This was really common in England. And after the the Anglo-Saxon conquest, that dropped to a large extent and, and the church re, sort of redefined this worship um, and it started being less nature oriented or less oriented around things which might be arguably pagan influenced. And so probably something very similar happened after the Norman conquest. Right, and do we have any follow-up questions? Uh, uh, yes, how did, the uh, Andrew, affect, thank you. how did the conquest affect the foreign affairs of England with Europe, North Africa, and Asia? I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat that question? I think we had two people asking at the same time. Was that from Rod? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch no, it's the from, question. It, it's from Tarek. Um, and I'm, oh, in the discussion it. box. I'm yeah, sorry, how did yes. the conquest affect the foreign affairs of England with Europe, North Africa, and Asia? Right, well, there's definitely changes in terms of the relationship between England and Europe, maybe less so as regards North Africa and Asia. Obviously, in terms of trade with Europe, there would have been increased trade with France. There would have been a lot of importation from France as these new food items were coming into 
England, a lot of these were essentially French, French foodstuffs. So this was coming into England. That was one really big change. Uh, so increased change with France and France's allies would have been the European change. There would have been some indirect relationship there with North Africa and Asia as well. You could imagine that France was very likely doing more trade with Northern Africa, for example, and with Asia than England would have been in the Anglo-Saxon period. So there was likely an increase in trade in general. Uh, there was probably more economic activity um, as a result of this almost sort of marriage between England and France. So yes, probably a lot of activity on that front. Um, do you see a few more questions in here? The Doomsday Book, yes. So is this one of the many primary sources your society uses to trace lineages? Um, maybe not so much lineages. It's more a primary source for understanding the, the demographics of the day. It's, it's not a book of lineages. It's not a book of family history or genealogy. It is a book telling you the general makeup of the population at the time, some of the cultural habits of the time, where people were living. So it's more a demographic source. Um, primary sources of this time might be, yeah, more, more focused on some of the early historical accounts that you can find of the historians of that time, uh, the, the writers who did put down the names, for example, of William's companions, uh, which are all listed on the Augustan Society website, I believe, as well. Um, we had another question about the feudal system. What kind of changes happened to the feudal system? Well, yeah, I briefly touched upon that. So if we go back a little bit, um, one significant change really was the redistribution of land under Williams England right so what we have is the Anglo-Saxon feudal system was essentially shut down and then entirely replaced with with Williams own feudal system and also this was less de decentralized so instead of having these very powerful earls in different parts of the country with a lot of their own power without much reporting back to the king what we have instead is less powerful lords all very loyal to william reporting regularly back to william and spending some significant time at court uh, so what we find is a less decentralized system as a result of the new feudal system and a complete change in the ownership of land. All right, but all very good questions. And I think that some of those might be ideas for a follow-up uh, presentation in the future. And yes, Andrew, you had a question? Yep, can, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate you've got a lot to fit in in a short period, but I, I feel you've, you've underplayed the harrying of the North grossly. Uh, I think you, you quoted till, nine, till 1071, and I think 1079 is closer to the mark. And it's not just um, a, a military campaign. This was a, a campaign of genocide. If you look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and um, other um, contemporary writers, you'll see that people were driven off their land. The land was salted. Uh, people were eating each other and cats and dogs. They were starving. They were um, uh, driven off the land both north and south. And uh, the contemporary accounts are very, very similar to the effects of starvation experienced in concentration camps in World War II. The, this is an event that impacts people even today in England. There are people in the north of England who today resent that Norman harrying, that genocide that took place, and it's reflected in the language and the resentment of the north-south divide in England. I, I think you've underplayed it grossly in just saying it was a military campaign. And you missed out altogether Hereward and his heroic stand against William, um, which was part of that harrying campaign. Not a criticism, right. just an observation. 
Right, no, definitely. And I, I sort of intentionally didn't go into the hiring of the North in a lot of detail because I feel that would be a slight shift in the purpose or the focus of today's talk. The greater focus was more on, as I highlighted here, some of the uh, this category of changes, um, more with so, sort of some of the lasting changes of the conquest. But the harrowing of the North would be a good topic for a separate presentation because it did have such huge and dramatic changes at which simply couldn't be covered in today's talk but you are right that for example the domesday book does mention um in 1086 as late as 1086 that large areas in yorkshire and elsewhere were and elsewhere were still completely wasted by this by this harrowing which could quite easily be called a yeah a genocide or a large-scale massacre certainly um yeah so i think that that would need a talk in itself and perhaps it would be also good to have uh separate talks on maybe the positive and the negative impacts of the conquest and how it had certainly some positive impacts but also some really terrible uh lasting impacts as well yeah that's yep. for sure okay thank you andrew All right. Do we have any other comments or questions? Right. Well, the talk was quite intentionally introductory because I wasn't sure who would be who exactly would be coming to the event, what background knowledge attendees may or may not have. So it was a very introductory event, but something we would like to do in the society in future as we're, we're hoping to do between two and four talks per year. So something we would like to do in the future is perhaps go into more detail about particular elements of this very broad subject. So this was a very basic overview of these changes and there could be a talk uh, as Andrew mentioned just on the harrowing of the north or there could be a talk just on the linguistic changes or just on the the religious changes and the restructuring of the church for instance and so maybe that's something we'll look into in future talks something else we're hoping to do is to bring in experts uh, to give talks at the society as well. We're going to invite uh, authors, uh, professors, experts from different aspects of this Norman, the Norman period uh, to give some talks here at the Society of Descendants of the Conquest. So that's something to keep tuned in for. And if you follow our Facebook page, we do post about any upcoming events. You can also subscribe to the, the newsletter of the Augustan Society at the link provided. Um, just having a look in the comments to see if there were any more. There were a few more questions. Uh, we have, okay, someone is asking if the slides will be made available. Yes, I can make the slides available. I will, if you email the Augustan Society, then we should be able to pass it on and the contact details are on the website. Alternatively, you can email the, if I just post it in the comments, alternatively, you could email the or message the Augustan Society Facebook page and I'll provide the link to that as well as the link to the Facebook page of the, the Society of Descendants of the Conquest. We have two separate uh, Facebook pages. So if you send a message on there, that's probably a, a quick way to get a response in terms of the slides. The other one is... And I'll post the other link as well once I find it. I think we also had another question regarding marriages, it might have been. Let's have a look. Yes, uh, did any marriages occur between the French Normans and the Anglo-Saxons? And if so, did this make the transitional power quicker, effective, and easier? Yes, definitely there was intermarriage, maybe limited at first, but over time intermarriage became the norm so that several centuries later, 
there was no longer this strict distinction between the Norman aristocracy and the Anglo-Saxon populace. So it, it took some time because obviously in this era, you find the aristocracy generally marrying among themselves, right? That's that's the norm. But over time, you would find a mingling of the old Anglo-Saxon nobility and Norman nobility. This, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this had already happened um, prior to the the conquest itself. There already had been some intermarriage between the the Norman nobility and the House of Wessex. So yes, uh, is this the short answer for that? Um, I see Rod has posted a good or a interesting podcast covering the harrowing of the north. Okay, fantastic. And I see Tarek has a question. Um, yes, Tarek, would you like to? Uh, it right. seems to be a question directed at Andrew. Is that right? But if you maybe about the harrowing of the north, but please go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, by the way, for the uh, for for the presentation. I'm uh, I'm from uh, Morocco, so uh, I'm gonna, I want to ask you something, Andrew. Uh, you, you mentioned the Herring of the North, right? Yeah. Um, which was a massacre because obviously you know the resistance was coming from the north. Uh, what would have been the alternative for uh, you know, in your opinion, the alternative for William? Uh, in order to subburden the uh, the people of the north without doing all that things, you know, all those massacres uh, uh, to them. What would it be like the alternative in your idea? Well, it's 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 impossible to um, to second guess a, a medieval um, despot like William, um, and judging by today's standards. What he did was what medieval people do, which was slaughter people uh, who disagreed or resisted. Um, the scale of it was quite outstanding at the time. Uh, that's the point I was making. It, it was a major event that's had lasting implications uh, for English history and, and society. Uh, it's reflected in our language today. Uh, People in the north of England speak with Germanic rounded vowels. People in the south of England speak with French long A's and shallow U's. And, and this, this is a reflection of the, the integration or the, the, the better integration of Normans in the south as opposed to those in the north who still maintain their independence and their, their wish to have Edgar the Atheling as their a monarch rather than William the Bastard, who had no legitimate claim whatsoever to the English throne. He, he was just an opportunist, uh, uh, a despot who seized uh, the opportunity to, to make himself mega rich. Um, as, as our host said, it's the subject of a totally um, absorbing and different lecture. Perhaps we haven't got time for it here. But in, in short, Yes, you're right. William was a despot, and despots slaughtered people in those days. Um, that's what they did, and the options for different solutions were limited. What else can I say? And we sort of see that from William's restructuring and his emphasis on defense that it was about control. It was about having a total controllable territory, which was Norman at the top and Anglo-Saxon at the bottom. And he was willing to go to great lengths or extreme lengths and cruel lengths in order to achieve that. that I think that's quite clear from any, any look at the conquest, that that's certainly the truth. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've one thing we have raised today is some great ideas for future talks. And that's really good because we are looking at the society for different topics and different perspectives. I think it would be good to look at the other side as well at some stage, maybe to look at some of the yeah, the negative consequences of the conflict um, and how, how that impacted people at the time and in the centuries that followed into the modern day. So that's a good idea for a future talk. And we're I'd also like to go into more detail about specific elements of that legacy. 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we can hand back to Rod then maybe for a few closing words if there are no more questions. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, I, I really appreciate your taking your time out in a busy day. The fact that we had people on four continents participating in this presentation is really incredible. So that's a, that's a wonderful uh, accolade, I think, that Dean Ironside can put in his hat, because I'm not sure we've had that to date. So that's 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 impressive. Uh, I think also if you have other questions or something comes to you, as I say, windshield processing, since where I live, I drive a lot um, being in a remote rural town. Um, feel free to put those in the Facebook, uh, join the Facebook uh, just, uh, for the descendants of the conquest and post your questions there and continue the discussion there. Uh, we look forward to other talks. If you've signed up for this, the email you use to sign up for registration for this is one that will be used to let you know when other presentations will come about. And I believe there's another part of the society looking at doing something in the fall. So with that, I'm gonna wish everybody a wonderful uh, weekend, wherever you are at. Thank you for joining. Thank you, uh, Dean Ironside, for a great presentation. I learned a lot and I, I appreciated just the early evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.